Yeah, that was hard, but you did it. That was scary, but you, you know, but you did that. You know, um, that took a lot of hard work over a long period of time. But look what you've achieved. Look what you've became. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, episode one hundred eighty-six. And thanks for stopping in today. We hear from Mr. Ian Abernathy a well-known martial arts podcaster and expert on the practical application of karate. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host as well as the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the best place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining, you're going to get our top 10 tips from martial artists, an exclusive never before, never will be released episode. It's got great stuff, stuff you've probably never heard anywhere else. Our newsletter, that's going to keep you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, tell you about upcoming show guests. In fact, that's the only way you're going to find out about the upcoming show guests. And we even roll out discounts on our products from time to time. Speaking of show guests, who do you want us to talk to? We've talked to somewhere around 100 martial artists so far, I think actually over that, but we're always looking to bring you new people, new perspectives. We work hard to bring you a diverse set of guests from different styles, different locations. If there's someone you're dying to hear from, let us know. We'll see what we can do. There's a form on the contact page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com you can use. Mr. Ian Abernathy is not your typical martial artist. In some ways, he is very much like other guests we've had. He's passionate about martial arts, he's dedicated to his training, and he's determined to give back to the practice that has given him so much. But in other ways, he's so focused on what he does, so intent on spreading knowledge that other martial artists, including myself, are just blown away. He's someone I've wanted to speak with for a long time, and now it's happening. So enjoy. Mr. Abernathy, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. I am happy to have you here. We we've tried to do this. We we tried to do this once before, and it and it didn't happen. That's right. Lost I, lost I, I... in the depths of email, <laughs> <laughs> as is wont yeah. to happen at times. Well, I appreciate you reaching out, and I, and I'm saying I'm glad to, uh, glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. Now, listeners may know you from the fair amount of content that you put out, whether it's your podcast or. The writings. I mean, there, there's a mm. there's a lot of you on the web. It's good <laughs> stuff, and I appreciate it. You know, it's I I think my line of demarcation is if I am going to make the time to read somebody's martial arts stuff, it's got to be good stuff. And your stuff passes muster because I'm checking it out. That's very kind of you to say. I'm pleased you find that to be the case. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But how did you get started? You know, I mean, uh, you're you're out there, you're doing all this stuff, but you have some kind of origin story. <laughs> My superhero origin story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I um, I started as a, a child, around about eleven years old. Um, a few friends at school were going to uh, a local uh, martial arts school. I decided that I wanted to do martial arts. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd seen like the recently around that time enter the dragon i think had been on the tv over here so as a result of that every kid in school's got homemade nunchucks and you know everyone's going kung fu crazy and i remember going down the local library to try and learn something more about you know this is the martial arts and so i got a load of martial arts books out and every single one of these books said you know you can't learn martial arts from a book <laughs> so, so i thought okay right so i need to kind of take formal lessons obviously because i want to this is something i've decided i want to be good at um a quite a quiet shy kid didn't really do uh any other sport or anything like that so to go to a class was a, a big deal for me uh parents were you know my brother was really active played soccer and all that kind of stuff and ian did next to nothing apart from sitting around and read books so they were delighted at this notion you know great he's finally found something he wants to do so my dad drove me through to the, the nearest uh, class. It was a class that my friends were going to, which is about 14, 15 miles away from here. Uh, very first class, I got dropped. I got punched in the belly and hit the ground. I um, got winded during a drill that I didn't perform correctly. 
Uh, and the friends that I was going with, there was a grading the very next week. They failed and quit. <laughs> so, so the start was, um, it was not a good one. I, I remember when I was, again, leaving the class, the, the, the one where I got dropped on, the instructor at the time uh, that was covering my class that, that night, that day, uh, he said to me, look, I'm really sorry I couldn't spend much time with you today. So if you come back next week, I, I, you know, I have to focus on these lot for the grading. When you come back next week, I'll spend some more time with you. So I get back home and my mum says, you know, how did the class go? You know, so I hated it, didn't enjoy it. You know, I mean, it wasn't for me. And she's like really disappointed. So she says, look, maybe go along, give it another try, you see. So I was like, oh, you know, he did give me a free class and he did say, you know, come back next week. So I felt guilty, really, almost obliged. Went back the second time. While the grading was going on, this instructor took me to one side, went through a few things with me, and that was it. The bug just bit, you know. So I've been kind of going back, you know, to that dojo for ever since really so that's that's kind of how i got started um, initially that's quite the 180 degree flip from you know class one to two do you remember what happened what what was that difference that bug i i, I do not genuinely i think what it was it's a, it's a it's a very clear image in my mind we were doing um uh, I'll, I'll, so you've got your lunging punches. I don't know if all your audience will be Japanese martial artists or familiar with the terminology, but you've got your oizuki, which is your punching with your lead hand forwards, and then you've got your gakazuki punching with your back hand forwards. Well, while I'm doing this, I'm messing my feet up like most beginners do. You know, you concentrate on your arms and your legs go. You concentrate on your legs and your arms go. So I, I'm trying to remember where these things are supposed to go. And then the instructor just said, he goes, just change your feet. He goes, now bend your leg a bit more. He goes, that's it. So I did another one. He goes, that's it. And it was just that initial feeling of, ah, I can do this. You know what I mean? Just I've, I've made some progress. Well, I think the first class I was left confused and beaten. <laughs> but on, on the second one, there was beginnings of, I can, I can see this making progress. But going back, you know, I was nervous every class. You know, I remember it distinctly that every class I didn't want to go. You know, there was a part of me that, like, you know, didn't want to go, but I just kept forcing myself and forcing myself. And as time went on and you make progress. And I think for me, that was probably, yeah, looking back, one of the first times in my life where I decided I want to do this. I put the effort in and I can see myself making progress. And that revelation that, you know, you can do that, you know, you can apply yourself to something and make progress. That's a um, very uh, addictive feeling, I think. And I think, you know, one that, you know, whatever it is now, 35, 36 years later, I still haven't shaken off. Wow. All right. Yeah. You know, it, it's always interesting me, to me that the difference between those that start martial arts and continue and those that don't, because I started so young, I don't remember. I, mm. you know, I was young enough that I did what my mother told me to do. And if she, <laughs> if she said, go to martial arts and keep going, I would say, okay, because you know, yeah. I, I was four. Um, and, and we've talked about that on the show once or twice before that my instructors said after me, they would never take anyone under six. So <laughs> I, I ruined it for a number of others. But when people can remember what worked and what didn't work, I think that's really valuable for the instructors out there to know, hey, this person clicked, this person didn't. So we can be, all become better instructors. Well, well, the, the one, like the one thing that I took from that, you know, what I mean, so all, all these years later, was um, because th that initial thing, where there was a guy called Alan Banks. He was just you know, first down at the um, at the club. He was like an assistant instructor to the main instructor, a guy called Doug James, who's now ranked eighth down. I think he was fourth down at the time. Uh, but but um, and Alan's long since given up martial arts, but I still keep in touch with him and talk to him occasionally. But when 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 Alan uh, had said to me, you know, like uh, um, come back next week and I'll spend more time with you, what he signaled to me there is, you know, there's there's an interest in me developing, you know. So I've tried to instill like, the same for the beginners as well, just to make sure that they feel, look, you know, you're really welcome here. I want to see you do well. I'm invested in your progress and try and communicate that. That, that to them in the same way that Alan did to me. So the, the feel that they belong. Because I remember as well, it's scary to step in the dojo for the first time. I think some of us forget that. You know, we've been there that long and it's just home from home. We forget that the first time we stepped into this strange environment where people are speaking a different language, sometimes dressed in funny uniforms, where people are going to kick and punch you. And this, they're allowed to do that. They're encouraged to do that. It can be terrifying. So I think anything we can do to make people feel, look, you know, you're welcome here and we want to see you do well here. And we want you to be part of our group. Anything that we can do to achieve that, I think, helps keep the, the door open. Absolutely. I agree. Mm. So as you aged and 
you kind of found your niche in martial arts. I think, you know, 2020 is hindsight and we can look at what you're doing now. And clearly you found mm. your place in the world within the martial arts. But I'm guessing that didn't happen day two. So where where did that happen? At one point, did you say, this is where I want to dedicate my life? Yeah, um, in all honesty, very quickly. You know, even as like as a as a, a, a kid, I, I knew this is it. And the first one I can um, see this is this is one of the things that, that I, know, I don't do anything by halves, and that's both a blessing and a curse. It can be a, a problem as much as it can be a, a great help. Um, but but when I decided, you know, I, I I like this, I want to be good at this. This is my mark. That really latched. And I think the first time I can remember thinking this was uh, I was in the back of my parents' car and I was working out how if I passed, you know, most of my gradings going forward, by what time would I get my first damn grading, the black belt? And would that enable me to go to university or further education or not? So even then in my mind, and I'm not recommending anybody do this, but that's what I did. I thought what's more important to me, more important than my academics and my career, even at that young age was, I want to prioritize getting my black belt. Now, as it was, I left school at 16 and I chose a job. And the job I did chose, I became an apprentice electrician. The job I chose was because it would enable me to carry on training. I picked that job specifically because it wouldn't interfere with training. So my whole career was uh, around it. As part of that training, there was an academic component. We'd be sent to college every week, and I'd pass everything with merits and distinctions. So I'm told by um, the people that I, you know, I work for, look, you know, you can go on and you can do higher diplomas and maybe even go on to do a degree in you know, electronic engineering, and this is something you can consider. And I said, well, what nights would that be? They said Thursdays. I go, it's no good. I train on a Thursday. You know, so, so I, everything about me from day one was – you know, and I knew this is what I want to make my, my mark with. Um, now, so whether that's a, um, I mean, as it is, it worked out. If it didn't work out, it would have been incredibly dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but, but looking back, um, that that was that was something that's bit from from day one. But that's me through and through. You know, I, I can't. And so where that comes from, I'm not self aware enough to know. But when I've decided I want to do something, it's it's it's, it's going to get done. And that means I have the same when it comes to things that. You know, um, I need to let go of from time to time. You know, like for example, if I read a book on a topic, I will read every book on that topic. You know, until I'm satisfied that I I've got it understood as I wish to understand it. You see, so I think that just kind of natural played out through the martial arts because that was the first thing I went. No, I want to be good at this. I like this. I want to be really good at this. We've heard from a number of our guests, and admittedly, I'm the same way. When something interests me, I tend to become consumed. Mm. Is it that personality type tends to find martial arts and do well, you think? Or does martial arts cultivate that kind of personality in children? Yeah, that's a good question. Is that, um, see, I, 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 I would think it's probably a bit of both. If, if you think about in, in training, it's one of the few things that it rewards fastidious attention to detail. You know, and, and and it's something that we can all uh, make continual measured progress at as well. So looking at the people that I train with, it's one of the things I love about the martial arts. I get to spend, I mean, I say it all the time at the seminars. The thing I love about this is I get to spend time with what I call my tribe. You know, these are my people. You know, they, they like the same things I like. They are of... As, uh, as obsessive and enthusiastic about exactly the same things that I am. So, uh, so I think there's probably an element of it being an initial attractor, I think. Um, but definitely, I think the martial arts supports that as well. It rewards that kind of uh, personality type, I think, and that kind of um, rel relentless pursuit. And of course, we see some people that become all consumed and then burn out, whether it's in martial arts or other things. Mm. How do we stop that? Yeah, see, I'm I'm definitely guilty of that too. You know that that's it. it uh, I've said this is a long time. It takes more discipline for me not to train than it does for me to train. So um, I would do you know dumb things. I'm full of cold. I still go to the gym. I'm injured. I find a way around it. I remember the doctor. I had a shoulder injury. I go to the doctor and he said. Uh, you know, you really need to rest that. And I went, yeah, no, I will. And he goes, no, Ian, seriously, <laughs> you really need to rest that. No, and fine, well, that I'm not going to, you know. 
Um, and then, of course, I think for me, what happened was I just got older, so my body just wouldn't play ball anymore. I realized that if I just push and push and push, it's one thing doing that in my 20s and to a degree in my early 30s. You can't be doing it in your mid-40s because your body just goes, it's not happening. So um, it, it took a long time for me to learn that you know the way I was training was often inefficient. Um, it was injury inducing. It, it was um, sometimes it even took the enjoyment out of it. You know, it, it became a, uh, an obsessive chore. Um, so I'm, I'd like to think I've got a little bit better. I wouldn't uh, balancing that now simply because having got that little bit older, I know that if my body's saying not today, then I have to listen to it. Otherwise, it will be okay. You didn't listen, so we're going to keep you out of action for the next week or weeks. You know, so. Um, so I guess growing out of it's the only way we get uh, we get better at it. I mean, and, and again, as you know, people can tell me that any good training regime needs that balance that you need your sleep and you need your rest and all that kind of stuff. And I could say that now, and but I know that if there were anything like me, they would just people would just ignore that and do what you know. If you're obsessive about it, you're obsessive about it. Yeah, yeah, and we've had a number of folks on the show that have said that very same thing, and. I'm as guilty of it as the next person. And of course, yeah, that it, that lesson tends to come with age where we're physically forced to start making some changes to the way yeah. we train and quality of training, perhaps over quantity of training. Well, I think that's what I find, you know, with the certain things that I, I do them now and I think I'm doing it better than I've ever done it, but I can't do it for as long. <laughs> that's the big difference. The judo training was a revelation for that as well. So I'm training with the, the, the judo guys and they're, all super fit guys in their early twenties. And at the time I'm in my mid thirties and there was that realization that I just, I can't keep up, you know what I mean? I just, there's no way I can possibly keep up with this, you know? So, um, and I think the training's better and healthier for it. See, when I look at one of my, you know, Peter Considine's one of my main teachers these days, he's a ninth Dan, um, 70 year old. He still trains like, you know, I'm a, a mad man, but he's, he's training. He's very, it's hard and intense but it's very scientific and very well measured. So there's certain things you just won't do anymore, you know, in order to keep it functioning. So I try and follow his example, really, because, you know, if I'm, I mean, people say to me, you know, I bet you'd love to be as fit as Peter at his age. I think, well, I'd love to be as fit as him now. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind at his age, you know, just because, again, he's, he's, he's trained smart. So he's trained hard, but smart, you know, he, certain things he won't do anymore. Like he won't kick or punch the air and stuff like that just for fear of damaging joints and things. So there's um, uh, a wisdom that it comes to uh, the, in the way that he trains. So I, I try and copy a little bit of that too. I think. If you could roll back a couple decades and, you know, tell your younger self some things that you've learned now, what would you say? Because I mean, we, we have younger folks listening to this show. And, yeah. You know, but, 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 but I know I wouldn't listen. <laughs> so, so, so based on that premise, you know, I, I know for a fact I wouldn't have listened. But, but I think, like, to give examples, I think it, the, the one thing I can remember, if I couldn't get a technique down, the sensible thing to do, of course, is go, okay, I'll, well, I'll work it, as, try and improve it as much as I can, and then, okay, finish training now, get on with the rest of your life. That, that wasn't me. If it wasn't quite right, I'd do it again and again and again. And if it still wasn't happy, when I'm forced to leave and train, I'm obsessing about it. I'm not happy about it. It's almost depressing me a little bit. It's dragging me down. I can't wait to get back to the dojo so I can, I can work on it some more. See, and that's, looking back, that's not psychologically healthy. You know, so I, I, that's definitely something that I've left in the past. I can have a bad session now. Yeah, well, it was a bad session, but it was still a session. And I couldn't do that when I was younger. And, and I think training would have been more productive and more enjoyable if I'd just been able to do that thing. Okay, I'm done now. Good or bad or indifferent, I'm finished. I just want to leave it. So I think the main bit of advice I would give me is, you know, yeah, imply yourself while you're in the dojo, work hard when you're in the, in the dojo, but it's not the be all and end all of your existence. And when you leave, you know, put it aside and go and concentrate on something else, you know, because um, I didn't do that. And I think that was the main thing. I don't think psychologically it was healthy for me to be that, that obsessed with it, you know, especially when it turned negative and I was berating myself for not getting a particular thing right or not being able to achieve a certain thing. Were you really hard on yourself? Oh, brutal. Absolutely brutal, yeah. The, the, um, which is, again, which is an odd one because, you know, this doesn't come from anywhere. I can say uh, instructor was always, you know, was hard but very supportive. Um, family always very supportive. But I, I think there's that um, 
side of me that was that was very harsh on myself um in a way that definitely was but I'd, I'd experienced that in all kinds of things like if i was training uh, there, there, there was it would bring an intensity to it so there's the, like you know i'll get almost like an eternal conflict i'd get mad at myself if something wasn't physically achievable and i despise my own weakness you know for not being able to do certain things uh, and then when you know if I, if I achieve something i feel good and then it's the next thing next challenge so um again that's the negative side like you mentioned at the start you know i throw a lot of content out there well that's that's a result of that mindset is like you know get it done finish the project onto the next thing which again can be positive but it can also be negative and back then it was it was um, negative more often than it, it should have been i think so that would definitely be the big bit of advice i would give myself is just you know chill out you know you'll training will just be as beneficial you'll just do as well and it, it, you don't need to kind of berate yourself in the way that you're doing yeah there, there's a yeah. There's a mindset, I think, that sometimes forms with that negative self-talk, and I'm speaking from experience here, that, mm. you know, you can work yourself into a hole that starts to have physical manifestations. Mm. You know, you tell yourself, I can't do this, or I suck at this, or however you would term it. You do that long enough, and you actually stop being able to do the things you could do. Mm. So that's it. Well, I remember this is like that, that, that getting the... Uh, that was something that so again i can remember exactly where that came from as well this idea that 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 positive self-talk was important there was um uh, lauren christensen um uh, from oregon you know he he wrote um he's written some fantastic martial arts books but way back when he wrote a book called um the way alone it was a small book by uh, paladin press but it was on ways in which you could train on your own so I buy it from this uh, mail order martial arts supply in Wales uh, and can't wait because this is, this book's going to show me all new ways in which I can beast myself even when I haven't got a training partner, you know. So the book comes and there was a section in it on, you know, visualization and mindset. And it was, I read it, oh, it makes a great deal of sense. So I think that was my first introduction to that idea of, of, of keeping the mind uh, positive. But 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 even then, at that young age, I, I I would I would twist it a little. So it, it, I would tell myself it was positive, and but it wasn't. Looking back, it wasn't. You know. So you you do things like, you know, I can do this, and I'd push myself into the ground as a result. You know. So um, that. But eventually, when I got a bit better at that, the, the internal self talk thing got a lot better. I, I never really got down on myself for like, you know, you can't do this, you're useless. That wasn't really part of it. I I I knew I was progressing at this and I knew I was getting good at it. But it was that dissatisfaction, you know, I always wanted to be uh better than I was, which again in itself is not a bad thing, but if 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 you um concentrating so much on it to the point where you're pushing yourself to an unhealthy degree, I think that that's when it crosses the line and becomes a bit of a problem. Has your attention on different aspects of martial arts changed with time? Oh yeah, age? yeah, yeah, def definitely. I mean, and, and originally, the, the, I, w I wanted to go to the uh, martial arts because I wanted to learn how to fight. You know, as a young kid, you get into your fair share of scraps, and I, you know, I thought that was part of the reason as well as the, and I can look cool while I do it, Bruce Lee style. <laughs> <laughs> thing, you know, I, I, want, I wanted to learn, you know, this is something I want to learn to be able to do. So that self-defense side of it was always uh, key, was always there, and that's still there. But I, I think, um, obviously, competitively, I, I did little bits when I was uh, younger. The whole club did. Every competition that was there, we entered it. It was never really where my heart was, but I did it. Um, and... and, and then, you know, as you get that, I became really interested in the kind of practical application side of things. And during my kind of 20s, uh, that was that was the the driver. And then as I've kind of gone, you know, late 30s, you know, mid 30s onwards, I've started almost like full circle a little bit and started coming to realize that there's lots of many other benefits to the martial arts away from um, the kind of practical application of self-defense skills. So now I'm also enjoying the art side of it for you know, art for its own sake, I'm starting to enjoy and the, the culture of it a little bit more. I'm starting to appreciate it a, a bit more. Um, the, the demarcating the skills I use to fight with a fellow martial artist and to enjoy that fight and then keeping that separate from the things that I would use for um, self-defense purposes. So I've got a much broader view, I think, of the martial arts now than I originally had. 
and I'm enjoying exploring all those various aspects, still keeping them very much separate. I don't like to contaminate one with the other, but um, I've definitely developed a, a broader view of what my karate or what I want my karate to be about. Now you kind of rolled over competition there, uh, you know, saying you, you did it and you it sounds like you did a fair number of them, but it mm. was, I believe the words you used were your heart wasn't in it. What yeah. Do you mean, what do you mean by that? Well, um, so the, 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 that, the club that I was in, as soon as there was a competition, everybody went. It was part of the club ethos. You know, we'd hire a bus and we'd go to the clubs. So it, it wasn't like, you know, I don't want to compete. You just Everybody competed. It was just part of it. The question of whether you want to do it or not was never asked. You just you just did it, you know, and it, but it was never thought about either. Um, and, but, but when I was training for it, I thought, this isn't what I started karate to do. So there's like little things I can remember, like I was training with uh, one of the guys and we're doing some uh, pad drills, but we're doing them in a competitive way. And I throw a head out roundhouse kick at the pad and my partner looks at me and says, that was too hard. And, you know, and to me, I just thought there's no such thing as too hard. You know what I mean? I, I, want, I want kicks that are harder and harder and harder. I don't want to be taking power out of my kick in order to fulfill this particular dictate, which I didn't get into the martial arts for anyway. So, so, so there was there was always that there. Is in I'm not really prepared to spend the time to train to get good at this, but I'll compete in it anyway. You know, my my heart was was elsewhere. I also this is just again part of my my, my mindset. I found it too restrictive. You know, it, it 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 I I you know so in the points karate, you know, there's there's not the the gripping and the locking and the choking and the groundwork and all this kind of stuff. And I was I was aware that you know the only reason you're good at this is because the rules say you're good at it. If somebody changes the rules tomorrow, you're no longer good at it. So it didn't strike me as being a real skill. It, it was it, I'm, I'm not saying it isn't, you know, but I'm just saying it was an artificial skill. It was a man-made skill, in the way that combative skills were, had value, irrespective of what rule set people happen to pick so it, it didn't it did just doesn't gel with me for a whole host of other reasons the weird thing is later on um when i started training the judo to supplement the karate i did a few judo competitions this is in my you know my th early 30s and um they those i really enjoyed because i think I'd, I'd been able to better compartmentalize saying okay this is is um sport competition fighting gameplay and i was better able to kind of separate it off but I, it, early on, I wasn't really able to do that. It was, you know, this is. No, but I think now, with the, if I had the mindset now, way back then, I'd be able to. Yeah, okay, this is competition, and it's competition, and I just keep that separate from everything else. Whereas at the time, it, it just didn't interest me really. Didn't gel with me. My, so I was still always happy when I won a trophy or a medal or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was always sure. nice. But it, it was never, uh, never where my heart was. When I compare karate to judo, I've. You know, I've got a background in karate and, and very little time in judo one summer. But when I think of the main difference, it's that karate has a huge body of knowledge that is not applicable in competition, whereas mm. judo has a much smaller chunk. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, well, I would. But again, I would, like all things, I'd add the caveat. It depends on where you train. So um, I know plenty of schools that you know still do all the traditional judo kata they even do a degree of striking as a result and and all that kind of stuff but certainly the club that i trained that was great club really good people great instruction but they were a they were a competitive club that the, the whole ethos of it really was to produce people for for competition so um they were very good with me and you know obviously they knew that that wasn't really why i was there um but but uh, and for exa example of that, when they change the rules to say leg grabbing is no longer allowed, we just stop practicing it overnight. Well, you know, we, as you know, in the karate thing, we go, well, OK, elbows, headbutting, knees are not allowed in competition, but we will do them anyway. Or at least most most people do. So I'd say broadly that's true, but I guess it depends on the club. Mm, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I enjoy the judo though because it, it fits well. I think in, in terms of, you know, they both use the Q Dan grade system. They both train in geese. The 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 they both use the Japanese language, so it fitted well with the um, the karate. There was still a lot of it that's not applicable that, that, that doesn't transpose over. Um, so, for example, what the judo certainly did was improve my throwing a lot, giving me a lot of nuances. First time my judo instructor watched me throw, he said, it looks like 1950s judo. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, well, it's, it's, it's actually even older than that. <laughs> but uh, I get what you mean. He says, like, so outdated, you know, I'm throwing like a karateka throws. 
so it was good to get that, that modern training methods and stuff that really helped some of, with some of the throwing uh, concepts but certain things didn't really apply like the deliberately taken to the floor isn't something that for the self-defense side of things is something i would do and a lot of the defenses because obviously in judo you, you when you're on the ground you lose by uh, elbow locks chokes or strangles or getting pinned on your back so the common defense is to flip onto your belly and cross your arms well you know self-defense wise that's suicide but but i still was able to go okay i'll just put all that to one side and enjoy the game of judo um and then later on of course when i brought it back to the dojo there was probably about i don't know 10 percent of what i learned would sit well with the karate um the rest of it you know didn't because it's designed for you know beating a judo in judo competition right so much of what you do is intentional i'm wondering if judo was a choice over say like traditional japanese jiu-jitsu yeah well well this is that where i came from was uh, so one of my uh, big influences. Um, one of the teachers was uh, Jeff Thompson. He's written like loads of you know self defense books. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Worked as a, a doorman in Coventry for the best part of a decade. You know this guy knows what a real situation involves, and that's why I went to train with him. Is to kind of refine the way I was training for that side of things. And um, while I was training with Jeff, uh, he was telling me, you know, so your striking's, you know, great. Real, Jeff's a judo uh, Dan Grade too. He says, you know, your striking's great. He says, the next thing you need to be developing on is getting your grappling up to the, the higher level. He says, so he says, uh, I recommended that I seek out judo. The judo was the art he recommended over the, the Japanese jiu-jitsu simply because they test it more, they fight more. Generally, you know what I mean? The, the, um, so I uh, had a student who was also a judo instructor I uh, went to talk to him and he said to me, well, you know, it's not me you want to kind of learn anything from. If you want to do judo, you want to train with my instructor. So that was how that connection made. So I would go and train with the elite level guys at their private uh, early morning sessions. And I'll do the club sessions in the evening as well. So I did that for, you know, a few years. Um, still love to be doing it, but the same thing. There's only so many hours in the day. So, yeah, so it's mainly I went to it because my instructor told me to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a pattern. Yeah, yeah. Well, he said that's one of the things that, you know, Jeff had remarked he always liked about me. He says, you know, he says, I can tell you to do something and you just do it. He says, you know, he says, sometimes I have problems with others where he says, you want to do this and then they'd go, oh, well, this didn't it. He says, well, it was you, you just go. So uh, I have a natural rebellious streak. I don't like generally taking instruction from people, but when I know that instruction's for my benefit, I'm prepared to put my ego to one side and go, this person knows what's better for me in a way that I don't. So, you know, if I have respect for my teachers, then I'm always able to go, okay, you know better than me. So whatever you say is what we're doing because you know this better than me and I've seen the quality of people you can produce. So my ego needs to shut up and I need to listen. So I've always been pr pretty good at doing that. Um, Which just, is, yeah. That's a skill that a lot of people don't have. You know, there, there are certainly a lot of people with a rebellious streak and especially as kids, you know, we're growing up with parents telling us what to do, teachers at school mm. telling us what to do, coaches and on after school athletic teams telling you what to do and here martial arts where quite often the instruction doesn't have a visible um, path forward, a visible benefit. Mm. Why are we doing this? Because I told you to, right? I mean, that's the yeah. methodology of a lot of martial arts instructors. Do you teach in that way? No. And, and I wouldn't respond well to that kind of instruction for me as well. So there's a subtle difference there, I think. So if I, if I went into a dojo and someone said, just shut up and do it, well, I would say, no, no, I, I need to understand why I'm doing this. You know, I mean, what's the point of this? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not prepared to shut off my intellect you know, for this. But I've always had instructors who have been pretty good at saying, look, we're doing A and B in order to lead us to C. And when, and when they've done that, then they've gone, right, for A, you need to do this. You might not fully understand it. You might disagree with it. You might not fully understand the benefits this is going to give you, but I want you to do it. And at that point, I've gone, right, okay, I understand the broad lay of the land. I understand where we're supposed to be headed. They've explained to me what the general intent is. And now I will follow the instruction because I respect their the view i know whether they're, they're going to lead me um i, I would find it difficult so I, I i'm almost like i'm submitting to their instructions on the basis i know i benefit from it 
I think one of the problems we can sometimes have in martial arts is, and it bleeds over to the self-defense side of things, if we encourage people to just go, all right, just shut up and do because I say so, self-defense-wise, that is encouraging a terrible mindset. You know, So we, we, in the dojo, we say, look, shut up and do whatever the biggest, fastest, hardest-hitting guy in the room tells you to do it. Don't ask questions. Just keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. That encourages that a, a kind of submission, which in self-defense purposes is what you've conditioned your students to do is shut up and behave, behave the instructions of the guy that's intimidating you. So I, I, I don't certainly don't teach that way. In my, in my dojo, we will laugh, we will joke, people will make fun of me um, for good reason. <laughs> but um, but in terms of and I want that kind of almost that informality. But when I say, right, this is the drill we're going to do, every single one of my guys will will do exactly what they've been told because I know I've got the best interest. So I'll give them drills to do that they won't like doing. Uh, and um, but, uh, but they'll still do it anyway because they know my best interest at heart. So they're doing it because they know I'm trying to help them. They're not doing it because I've said, look, just shut up and do because that's it's something I'm not particularly comfortable with. I want to unpack that a little bit because that's something that, as you're saying, it makes a ton of sense. And mm. I'm not saying necessarily you're the first person to come up with that correlation, but I haven't heard it before. Mm. How did you stumble on that? And how um, do you earn the respect of new students that come in? Yeah, well, well, I think this is um, where I'm really lucky. You know, I have like four or five kind of main teachers. Um, and they've all just been really good men. They've all been really nice guys. So, you know, when I went into in the, the, the dojo, I was always made to feel welcome. I was made to feel part of it. It was hard work and, and, I, and I was pushed. So I, it's the same kind of thing. So when someone comes in, new student comes in to me, they'll, they'll be greeted with a smile. I'll, I'll tell them, you know, that this is everybody that's here and um, I'll pair them off with one of the dang grades and he'll look after you. And hopefully straight away, the, the, the impression that they'll get from me is, well, he's a nice guy. You know, he's helping me out here. He's trying to put me at ease. He's doing the right things for me. And hopefully that kind of earns the respect that will benefit both them and me if it's shown rather than flat out just kind of, you know, look, I've got the black belt on. So I demand it, you know, it's, um, I also think there's something culturally about that. I don't know if it's a, a Northern England thing as well, but um, we, we haven't. It's a, there's a natural tendency to rebel against someone who puts themselves in authority without good reason. You know, if someone's in authority because they are seeking to benefit those that they have authority over, I think that tends to get quite well respected. I think if someone just goes, look, this is my position and my status and you have to accept it, it's not well regarded in my part of the world. Um, so that's, again, that's one of the reasons that I don't like my students to call me sensei for the same reason. And I know this is different in different parts of the world, but if I was to say to my guys, uh, no, I demand that you call me sensei or Chihan or whatever else, they, would, they, would, they wouldn't, that would come across as me being arrogant. And, and um, uh, demanding a false respect. So it's one of these things that's cultural to the area as well, I think. Um, we, we, and, and, and also they see that as well. They'll see people from other parts of the world refer to themselves as master this and master that. And there's an assumption, man, that's arrogant. And think, no, it's not arrogant. It's just a different uh, nationality. It's a different culture. It's a different way of doing things. But, but in, in my part of the world, that um, you have to, your first among equals is, is basically what you're trying to be. Interesting. That's mm. I'm wrapping my head around that because that's <laughs> an intriguing one. And of course, listeners, you noticed that, excuse me, Mr. Abernathy was introduced as that. And we had a short discussion about it, about the why and, and how we were going to get around that because, you know, this is episode 180, whatever, I don't even know yet. And I haven't broken that protocol. You know, I haven't introduced anyone by mm. their first name. So it's it's intriguing well, to me. Yeah, well, that, that's what my students call me, uh, I, 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 and, and you know they call me Ian, and that's what the, I ask them to do. And I've never called any of my sensei sensei either. I've always called them by their name because that's what they've requested from me. I, 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 obviously, I'm no sociologist, so I don't know the culture. But I would think my guess on this is here in England we have a long established class structure. You know, that's fun. So it, it's, um, you know, where you were born into a certain class and you will remain of that class. 
you know, there's a famous kind of even comedy sketch on it as well. You know, this idea that everyone should know their place. Um, so, I, and I think obviously as that's gone, you know, as, as we're coming a more well moving towards the best meritocracy we can manage, I think therefore there's still a hangover in people's mind and culturally. So when somebody goes, you will refer to me as, it, it almost comes across as I am Lord such and such. It just comes across as very arrogant. Mm. So, so again, but I'm not saying anyone who does it elsewhere is, and I certainly know, I, obviously I travel a lot with the teaching and the seminars and I know people who, you know, quite rightly, they'll, you know, they'll call each other sir and master this and, you know, sensei or sifu and it works within that culture. But um, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure everybody who's listening to this that, that is from, you know, certainly in the north because that's where I live. They'll they'll be able to say, yeah, that's that's true. We we don't do well with titles. It just doesn't fit with the culture. Um, but I accept that that's not the same the world over. Does that have any carryover to rank? Are are people there resistant to belt colors? Uh, no, no, belt colors are okay. Dan grades are okay. But 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 even then, it's it's preferred to be understated. You, you know, so if um, if I was to introduce myself to somebody and I went, uh, um, you know, so I said, oh, this is Ian Ian does karate, and if I was to drop into conversation now, oh, I'm a sixth dan, arrogant, mm. you know what I mean? That that would be done there. But so, but everyone will know you are. You might have the stripes on your belt, but it's just it's never really mentioned, you know. So, um. It's a strange one. I even go one step further than that in my own dojo as well. You know, typically in dojos, people will line up by rank. Um, in, in mine, and I and I always did that. In my dojo, we don't. We just line up wherever we want to be. Um, so it's a little bit more egalitarian. And, and part of that is because I want the lower grades training next to the higher grades because they almost it rubs off by osmosis even. So I found it to be a more practical way to do it is when they're doing line work and things. If the green belt is next to a dang grade, it's twice as fast as they are it encourages them to move quicker. Um, so I've br broken with this idea of having people lined by rank um, in the dojo too. They're aware that other dojos do that, but we, we don't do that. Um, and certainly in the way that everyone's treat in the dojo, they're all treated as equals. No, no, Nobody of a higher rank will be treated differently simply because they have a higher rank. But it's just simply when it comes to things like instruction and pairing off for sparring and all that kind of stuff. Then, then it will be acknowledged on the basis of the skill, but 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 that wouldn't go any further than that. It is an interesting one. It's one of these things that I wish someone would look at, <laughs> but it's probably such a nuanced thing, you know, yeah. that, that no one, no sociologist or psychologist will ever choose to examine the difference in the way that dang grades and ranks are perceived around the world. You see, so but I believe it's in other places. I mean, as I understand it. You know, in certain parts of the world, on your business cards and stuff, you'll write, you know, I'm Sifu this, or my name is Sensei or whatever. Uh, I believe in Japan as well, that's even considered poor form there. They don't they do not do that. Other people call you it, but you don't use it as a rank in the same way you would a, like a doctorate or a professorship or something like that. So I think it's just, you know, these cultural things. Mm. It's interesting, though. It, it is. And, yeah. you know, as I'm hearing you talk about having your students line up wherever they line up, I, I can I can see the benefit to that, but when you start talking about running drills, I have witnessed the benefit of that, and that's something that when I teach, I I'm not going to say that I go out of my way to mix people up out of their mm. lines, but I will absolutely not force them to get back into them because you're absolutely right. Having lower ranks next to higher ranks, there's a lot that happens there. Mm. I mean, I don't know how many people listening to the show forget what it was like to be a white and a yellow belt or whatever low ranks you went through, but you're spending a lot of time looking around saying, am I doing this right? And if the mm -hmm. only people right around you are not doing it right, <laughs> that's just yeah. limiting your progress. So put it, you know, when, when I'm trying to get somebody to learn a new form, I will stick them between two of the higher ranks. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to progress that much more. So, you know, there, there's a good way to kind of balance that if, if, if schools, owners, instructors listening aren't ready to go the, the, the full Monty, so to speak, and have everybody line up willy nilly, you know, have them train that way. Hmm. Well, I think that there is a, it, 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 obviously certain times, you know, if they were all doing different combinations, for example, then it's no good if, some are doing short ones and some are doing long ones because you have people crashing into one another, you know. So I can understand that certain times you need to order it because for what you're doing. But but generally, you know, I, I'm a great believer in if, if we do anything, we have to say, okay, why do we do this? And and the answer be, 
just because is never a satisfying answer. It's not one I would accept, so I don't expect my students to accept it either. So when uh, we did the rank thing, you know, I, I just noticed that, okay, when they line up wherever they line up, and it also it all just it, it balances certain other things out too, because exactly what you say there, for example, this week, I remember we had one of the, our beginners was next to the black belts, when one of the black belts when they were doing a bit of key on. The, black, the white belt, when he did his turn, did it wrong. Uh, I saw it, I'm just about to walk over, and the black belt notices out the corner of his eye that the beginner's done it wrong. He quickly corrects him and sorts him out. You know, so the, the, for the it's just as you say, it's nice that there's that correction on hold, and and again for the the ethos of the club, there the beginner then feels well, this higher grade is helping me. He's going out of his way to help me out. It's not just the guy at the front. All of them care about my progress. You know, so which is is, is quite nice. And then also for the higher grades, it gives them a chance to kind of pay something back. So it, it does it contributes towards a, a, a healthy family feel in the club as well. I find I'm not saying anyone who does it differently is doing it wrong. I'm just saying that definitely works for for us and the way that we uh, we do things. You know, it might not work for other schools, but it, it works just fine for us. Right. And I think it's important you're underscoring that, that different ways are okay. It's not right. It's not wrong. But one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we need to expose ourselves to the different ways so we mm. can have those epiphanies and say, I want to try that or that makes sense to me because of X, Y, Z. makes us better. Yeah, no, absolutely, definitely. You know, there's, I am a great believer in doing that. And this, again, where, where I've been really lucky, all my instructors encourage that. You know, all of them did. So if, if I expressed an interest in something, they'd be, right, okay, let's get, I know a guy who teaches that, we'll get him in and he'll share it with you. And, you know, it's right right back, Funakoshi talks about this as well uh, when he's talking about Itosu and Izato, his, his two main teachers. Funakoshi remarked, he goes, they shared uh, no petty jealousy of other masters. He said, and would introduce me to people that they knew so I could learn the methods at which they excelled. Well, that was my experience of learning. And I think sometimes what happens in the martial arts, because people are so desperate to keep students or build the little empires, what they'll do is they'll, they'll try and wall the students in. You know, our way is the only way. And anyone else who differs with this is doing it wrong. It's almost cult-like in its thinking. And, and it's counterproductive. Like what uh, one of my t teachers, Peter, has this line where he says, if you build walls around people, the first thing they want to do is climb over those walls. <laughs> so I'm part of a huge association. And part of the reason it's huge is people know that they benefit from being a member of it. But there's no restrictive practice. We let them go out and explore and find things. And if they can find a better way of doing things, then that's great. And I've even got that built into my grading system. Part of my aim for my students is as they get better, they should need me less and less and less because they should be capable of learning and thinking and developing things for themselves. I never want Ian Rue to exist, you know, because if I do that, I've failed. You know, I, I want to be able to give my, my students a, um, a step along the path and share with them what I've got. But, but I don't want them to kind of try and preserve it in amber or, or anything like that. I want them to move on and explore. And whether if they agree or disagree with what I put forwards, and that, that, that's healthy, I think. It's like MacArthur said, you know, General MacArthur, he said, if everyone thinks the same, somebody isn't thinking. So we, we, any environment where you're in where there's this dogma is not one that generally tends to be quite healthy. It's certainly one that won't progress. It'll stagnate sooner or later. Right. And of course, hmm. every single martial arts style, if we want to, put boxes around, mm. refer to things as styles. At some point, somebody made them up based on the <laughs> things that they had learned from other people. <laughs> See, this is it, you know, but, but it's amazing how um, people talk about, you know, keeping the purity and things like this, you see. And I got that, that a part of it, I, I can sympathize that with some degree because what people are saying is, look, this, this guy was a, a master and he created this and who am I to challenge what they've put forward? You know, and I get that, you know, you mean, again, you don't want to have the arrogance of, well, I've been training for two years and I reckon I can second guess a grandmaster. But but I, I always like it, the progress in science, you know, so you've got, if you think of no, no physicist looks back at Newton and goes, the fool, he didn't understand quantum physics. You know what I mean? No, no one does that. They go, because of what he did, he did all the groundwork for us. We were able to pick that, 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 that work he'd done, that work of genius and build on it. And, and by building on it, we're seeking what he sought. He wanted to understand the mechanics of the universe. So when physicists and look at that, they are building on Newton's work, not in a way that disrespects him, but in a way that honors him. So when I look at the 
the martial arts, I'm trying to do the same thing. I respect all my teachers. I respect the founders of what uh, 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 they've given me. Because without that, you know, I'd have to try and reinvent that all myself. You know, they've given me these these works of genius, but I don't serve them. And if I just go right, okay, I'll I'll stop. You know, I, I serve them by continuing that process, by taking the information they've given me and move forward. So I get that sometimes people think that uh, innovation is somehow dishonoring or uh, making something impure, but that's certainly not how I see it. And I doubt very much that. The founders of our styles think that way because, as you rightly said, they created the styles. None of them passed on exactly what they've been taught. So we're just following their example when we try and improve upon things as we go. Right. You mentioned yeah. Funakoshi uh, earlier. I can only imagine if he were to step into a dojo today and see what we're doing, he would see differences. He would see dramatic differences, even mm -hmm. among the schools that claim we are doing it the way he set it down. Well, see, and here's the interesting thing with that one, you see. So this is what I, I, I – there's we've got this weird thing where people uh, – tradition, the, the word has a meaning, right? So tradition means, you know, adhering to a long-established procedure. So what people think of as being traditional karate isn't. It's 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 Because one thing that traditional karate did, true traditional karate, was it evolved. And as Funakoshi himself said, um, uh, times change, the world changes, and martial arts must change too. Right? When he talked about the names that he'd given to Kata, he, he talked about how he had no illusion that these, these names would not be permanent. And, and, and you talk about, so Funakoshi is often referred to as the founder of Shotokan. And in Funakoshi's book, Karate Do My Way of Life, he said, um, I have heard myself and my colleagues referred to as the Shotokan school. I strongly object to this attempt at classification. And he went on to say that he viewed that all karate was one. He didn't want to see it divided into styles. So we, we see that in Funakoshi, the, he uh, was happy to train in other things. Um, he was happy to see martial arts evolve. He was aware that what he was producing wouldn't last forever. And he didn't want people to kind of preserve it and stylize it. So there's the tradition. And I think that's what we should be following because that's what ultimately the future generations of practice karate will benefit from. If we, it's like anything else. You look at any, you, you know, I'm, I live in Northern England. I'm looking out the window and I can see forests and trees and hills and all of that stuff that's living there. All every living thing that I can see out the window at the moment that's growing and changing as I'm looking at it. The only thing that remains exactly the same is dead things. You know, once it's dead, it remains. You know, that's it. You, the tree will remain is until it it rots. So it needs to be the same with the martial arts. They need to be growing and evolving. They shouldn't be static or preserved in amber because it's ultimately they'll, they'll die if we do that. You mentioned earlier, you know, your desire that your students never practice Ian Roo. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. you do, right? And, and, and I practice yes. Jeremy Roo. And, and really, I think if we get right down to it, everyone's individual approach to martial arts, even if you're training in the same school, and have the same experiences under the same instructors, it's going to be a little bit different because our bodies are mm. different. What we're bringing in for our personal experiences are different. Our interests might be a little different. And yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely, definitely. And, and, and that's how it it should be, I think. I mean, there's this um, uh, Shu Hari model, you know, the, the, you know, the way we're supposed to learn the martial arts that we copy, diverge, and transcend. So what, unfortunately, what we tend to have is, is copy, copy, copy being what's put forwards generally. Um, so, and it's not a free for all either. I think the idea is that the student comes at the dojo, like they come into mine, and I have 30 plus years more experience than them. So they'd be wise to listen to what I've got to tell them. So in the early stages, they, have, they don't have experiences of their own. They, they're not qualified enough to be able to make informed judgments about the way things should be done so in those early stages there's a place for just do this copy this right okay this is why we're doing it but do this but after a certain point you know we have to accept that okay now they've got their own experiences their own knowledge um their own ideas about how things should be done and so what i've in my grading syllabus if you like by the time they're into the dan grades it's starting to acknowledge that that i want to see things that they've created and rather than just saying okay copy what i have i have done so i want to try and build it into the process that they develop this idea of being able to think for themselves and critically look at everything and look at me and what i've taught and and then as they say they'll ultimately move on so um their karate if i've done my job right should be different from my karate 
Can you uh, offer um, some examples? You, you, you've mentioned that a couple times that as people get into the Don grades, the black belt mm -hmm. ranks, that you're expecting them to think for themselves and develop their own yeah. stuff. Uh, what do you mean more specifically? What, what might that look like? Well, I'll give a couple of examples. So if we give a basic one first, um, one of the things that uh, in the lower grades, they like to like, take throwing. Uh, both in terms of the katabunkai, and we have separate grappling sections, they'll be taught a set number of throws that everybody has to learn. Now, as, as you said, you know, everyone's got different body types and different preferences. So by time with the down grades, I stop saying, I want to see this throw, that throw, and the other throw. For gradings, it will be, I wish to see X number of throws uh, demonstrated with a striking finish, a self-defense finish, a ground fighting hold, whatever it is. So the student is then, I'm not telling them what throws I want to see them do. I'm saying, I want to see throws. You show me what your throws are. So they may be ones that I've taught them that particularly suit their body type, or they may be ones that they've learned from somewhere else or someone else. To give an example of this, I want to, we have to do, they have to do a set number of leg locks, for example, for one grading. Um, and one of the, the, the girls said, she said, would this be okay for my grading? And she did this really bizarre, she did beautifully rolling leg lock thing. And wow, it's really cool. So I think, yeah, that would be great for your grading. You do it really well. Where did you learn that? Do it YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so even then, you know, she's, she's seeking out information and bring it in. And, and so that's, that's one. Uh, and the other one is like with regards to cutter applications, uh, we have set drills uh, that, that, that I developed for every single one of the cutter we practice. But once they get higher up, I say, look, I want you to do these set drills, but I also want you to, uh, show me what we call secondary applications, which means I want you to look at the movement again and you tell me what else it might be. So that's my way of, of checking that for them, they might go, do you know, Ian, I think you've got this wrong. I, I think there's a better way to apply this movement. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's that kind of thing that we, we encourage them to kind of start showing us their own things and their own thinking. And I think it helps keep the students for longer, as well, engaged as well more, you know, keep, keep, keeps them going for longer because they don't feel which I know I've heard some people say, they can go to certain dojos and they'll do 30 years training, but what they're really doing is three years, 10 times, you know, it just becomes repetitive. Whereas when you're able to say, okay, go out into the big wide world and find stuff, and we will acknowledge that stuff. We will, we will reward you on the grading syllabus for going out into the big wide world and thinking for yourself. I think it, um, it encourages them. So there's some examples of what it would, would, would look like. Great. Hmm. Were you always encouraging of that? Uh, yeah, you know, because I was always encouraged that way. But by my own teachers did that with me, you know. So it was it was just a natural um, extension of it. But what 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 I did was, of course, I formalized it. <laughs> I formalized the informality uh, into the the grading system um, because you know I, I want them to be able to um, think for themselves. Um, I, but again, it's not a free from all from day one, as I say, because the, the, you know, if, if Johnny Yellowbelt tells me he wants to do his certain technique this way, well, I don't care. That's wrong. You know what I mean? I want you to do it this way. But at a certain point when someone's been training for 10 years or so, which is how, how, on average, how long it takes our students to get a first down. If they've been training for 10 years, I haven't done my job right. If they don't know what a good technique is at the end of 10 years. So if, if they're able to say, well, you know, you do the throw this way, I like this variation, no, that's fine. But even encourage that with our set pieces to a degree as well. They've got to do them exactly as we want them done for the lower grades. For the higher grades, they're allowed to, the phrase I use is add in their own dirt. So they'll keep the broad general outline, but they'll go, I'm going to insert a strike here. Now you did a punch, but I'm going to do a palm heel. And again, it just allows it to become their karate. So we've got that common core, but we all branch off it in different, different ways. Their karate. I think that's a, an important thing for people to understand. You yeah. know, we're, we're, we're talking a lot about, I mean, this has kind of been the recurring theme of our conversation, that individuality, that development of your own personal path. Hmm. Do you get into well, the, Please, go ahead. No, no, I was just kidding. I think it's, just, it's really, really important that that doesn't say it for that, um, uh, that they have that. So um, I know some people might like the idea of, I want to practice something pure, uh, unchanging. Um, but that's never been what the martial arts has been. It's, a, it's an illusion. 
So, you know, I, I would encourage people that there's a lot more fun in a living, breathing, evolving martial art than an illusion of a pure one. So that, that's just what I was going to add. Mm. Sorry for interrupting. You were about to say No, something. no, no. Yeah. You can't interrupt me. This is your episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am merely a guide on the path. <laughs> one of the things that we haven't talked much about today is kind of the philosophical side of martial arts. And I can't imagine that you have dedicated your life to this and, and have become so passionate about it without some views, without some um, notions on the personal development mm -hmm. aspect, which is something yep. that's really important to me. And I'd just be interested <clears throat> to hear your thoughts. Um, it's, it's really important to me, too. Um, so, for example, um, we on our club name, the name of our club, um, we call it uh, Abernethy, Abernethy Jason Karate Do. So that's Abernethy's actual combat karate do. And some people go, why have you got the do on the end? Surely you're a karate jitsu group. But the reason I, I, I keep the do is this idea of, no, a big part of what we do is that personal development. Because, and, and I wasn't always that way. There was a point where in my martial development that I really didn't care for that. It just seemed an irrelevance to me. Show me how to punch and kick harder. That's, that's, that's what I cared about. But um, you, you start to realize, actually, like most people, thankfully, we live in a, a time and, you know, I'm certainly living in where I live, you know, the violent crime is relatively rare. So there has to be another reason for training other than my desire to keep myself safe from crime. I joke about it at seminars. I say nobody wants to be sitting on the deathbed, you know, 100 years old saying, well, those 60 years in martial arts were a complete waste of time because no one tried to stab me. You know what I mean? That, that, there needs to be something else you're getting from them. And, and if you think of things like, um, so I always say that the martial arts need to be both life preserving and life enhancing. The, the, if, if, a, if a martial art approach ticks those two boxes i'm interested in it you if it only does one or the other i'm not interested in it because there are approaches that try and do one or the other so for the life um preserving side of it there's the self-defense side of it and then there's just keeping me fit and healthy most people listening to this are not going to die through violent attack it will they will die because of they, they smoke too much or they drink too much or they eat too much or they don't exercise enough you know that that's that's the the big killer you know is um in the modern Western world. So that martial arts should hopefully mitigate about that. And again, but there's no point of living to be a hundred if we hate every second of it, you know, the, the whole, but it needs to be life enhancing too, which is where the philosophical kind of side of it comes in for me. But just like with the practical, uh, the, the physical side of it, I, I think it needs to be demonstrable. Uh, some often people say, you know, you do the martial arts, it develops character. Well, my first question is, well, how show me how, what's the mechanism. And um, because I think sometimes it gets, uh, wrapped up in uh, esoteric sounding words and you know pop philosophy and martial arts are riddled with myths of connection to zen and temples and all that kind of stuff but but i think is if you're going to the door and this is like what funakoshi said if you're going to the dojo and you're working hard it develops a a, a, a tenacity in you which I think can be very useful in, 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 in everyday life. You learn about goal setting. You learn to deal with um, disappointment. You, you learn to keep uh, an even uh, keel um, in, in, in when you know, pressure's on. And I think those kind of things are absolutely, you know, arguably way more beneficial than your ability to kick and punch hard because you'll use them every single day of your life. How might we better foster that kind of a mindset in students as they're coming up? Is that something that just kind of comes with being in the environment? Or is that something that you have learned ways that you encourage it? Well, I, I think, I think you need to live it. I think if you're sitting around, it's like anything else. If you're talking about it, you're not doing it. You're talking about it. So I, I think it's better to live it. We've got to be careful that the door George doesn't become a, like a pseudo church. You know, where, whereas, you know, we, we'll, okay, we'll sweat for 10 minutes and we'll talk about philosophy for 20 minutes. You know, that, that's, that's not the, to me, that would, that wouldn't work. I think, you know, the, the, if the martial arts, if, he, if it's done right, and then the, the student will quickly realize, you know, look, look, the, the, the me of six months ago is fitter and, uh, is, sorry, I'm the me now, I'm fitter and stronger than I was six months ago. I'm more competent than I was. I've got more confidence than I did have. I've, I've, I had to do that grading and that was a bit scary, but I stepped up and did it anyway. So I've learned that I can overcome fear. 
and and therefore when I need to ask that girl out on a date or ask that my boss for a raise or change career, I'm used to doing it. I'm used to feeling what fear feels like. And I can and no, I don't have to listen to it. I don't have to become it. I can listen to its counsel, but I don't have to follow its dictates. And, and I think if if we have that those experiences in the dojo, they'll naturally spill out into everyday life. I think. Um, I mean, I like. I mean, it's one of my big passions. I do like to read loads of books on religion and philosophy and all those kind of things because it's just it's an area that really interests me. But uh, but I, I um, for in the, the the dojo, I just want the students to to live it. I want them to, you know, feel that, yeah, that was hard, but you did it. That was scary, but you, you know, but you did that, you know, um, that took a lot of hard work over a long period of time, but look what you've achieved. Look what you've became. You know, I think if you, if you can get the students to experience that, it naturally go, I, I see it. I can, I can, I, I can do that. And it's not just as Funakoshi said, you know, it just doesn't end in the, the four walls of the dojo. They can apply it to the, their everyday lives as well. You see, so. Occasionally reminding people of that can be useful, I think. Um, just, you know, um, like like uh, if we do it, like we have drills that some of them we do are just absolutely horrible. And when they've done <laughs> the drill, you know, they are, they're, they're absolutely terrible. You know what I mean? They're just, they're, they're, Such they're designed as? To be so, yeah, yeah, well, they're just, well, they're like, you know, they're just so physically intense. So I'll give one that jumps to mind. We'll do things like um, uh, students will break into threes. One of them will put pads on, so focus mates. Uh, we will uh, wrap the belt of the third student through the belt of the student who's going to be punching. So then you go, okay, you've got like a two minutes full on, do not stop punching. It's impossible to keep full intensity for I don't know, 30 seconds, never mind two minutes, you know. So the, 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 you're asking the physically impossible of them. And he says, so why are you hitting those pads? What the student with the belt can do is you can pull your left, you can pull your right, because you're effectively on a leash. So your legs are burning, you're trying to get this pad, you've been pulled in all directions, your heart feels like it wants to burst out of its chest, your shoulders are on fire, you know, you've got these two people who are fresh around you, encouraging you, and you'll keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And when they finish, they fall in a big heap on the floor, and they hated every second of that drill. And, and if I, as the instructor at the end of it, can go, no, well done you, you know, that was that was really good. You know, you, you, you thought through, you know, that there's, a, there's a, a lesson for them there, you know. And if, even if they fail, say halfway through the drill, they, they kind of throw the towel in, you know, even that's a positive thing. You say, well, you know, look, it would have been better if you'd kept on going. But the fact that you, it was that hard, that shows that you're, you're pushing your limits. If you're succeeding all the time, you're not at your limits. Failure is all part of it. So next time, maybe we'll do better. But at least you gave it a go. At least you tried to step up. So things things like that, I think, can be encouraging for people and can make them feel more, more powerful and more able. And ironically, we expose them to the weaknesses in order to get that to happen. That's where the lessons are. I mean, it is humanity. We tend to learn much, much more when we fail. Oh, well, I, 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 um, I, I, I agree. You know, it's um, um, and and then it's always, I think again, which goes back to the mindset thing, it, it, it's trying to avoid using um, like negative words around it as well. So um, if, 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 if everything's a success, so like even when we're fighting, when we're doing like the fighting stuff, I always say if the technique's blocked or counted or something like that, all he's giving you is another opportunity to do something else. So that's a mindset you want to fight with. You know, if he stops this, great, he's giving me something else. It's, it's an eternally positive mindset, you know, that, that, that I, I am going to win and I am going to dominate. And I think it's the same for the, the life thing as well. It is if something goes wrong, you know, or doesn't work out the way you intended. If you go, great, this is opportunities to learn. This might lead me in a better direction. Um, I hadn't considered that possibility before. Uh, I'm going to be stronger because of that trial or that tribulation. I think if we can um, approach everything in that way, that's when we've been like truly positive. If you see what I mean. So we may not achieve the goal, but we achieve other goals. And we, we we learn every time that we we uh, we can you know, but keeping that mindset, not going, I failed. I'm not going to learn from this. You know, that that's that's negative in itself. But if it's just okay, that didn't work. Now what? What's going to work next? I think if we can get that into students, that's that's a healthy attitude to have for for everyday life. You know, that high need for achievement and that low fear of failure. If you've got those two things, you know, whatever you choose to apply yourself to, you'll go far. I think you could almost wrap up martial arts training as learning a whole bunch of ways to not do things. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I like um, uh, Edison. That's what example is, you know, when Edison was apparently, whether this is true or not, I don't know, but it's a good story. When he's inventing the light bulb, apparently gets interviewed. 
and he's had 300 plus prototypes of this thing, some of which have blown up and some of which have caught fire and some of which, you know, just the whole kind of things. So this guy says, how's this electric light bulb thing going then? Which is a laughable idea. Fancy using electric to light a room, you know, just use a lamp. So how's this electrical light bulb thing going? And he said, oh, well, I've had 300 prototypes. And they said, okay, so what does it feel like to have failed 300 times? To which Edison replies, I haven't failed 300 times. I've successfully proven 300 ways that don't work. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Now, now whether that's that's true or not, it's a good story, you know. So it's one I like to recount at the the dojo, you know. I say to students all the time, it's better to die a thousand times in the dojo than once in reality. Learning, a big part of learning what works is learning what doesn't work. So if you do something dumb and it ends badly, okay, I ain't doing that again. And that's, that's, that's progress right there. It's not the kind of progress our ego is like, but it's progress. No. No, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. This has been great. This is, you, you've gone deep into philosophy. We, we've talked about you and, and where you've come from. And this was every bit as fun as I expected it to be. So I really appreciate you coming on. And I'm wondering if you might grace us with a, a one more thing. You know, of course. You've offered so much advice to the people listening, but we, we kind of like to wrap up with a bit of advice. So imagine you're at the front of a lecture hall and all of the listeners are sitting in chairs, hanging on your every word (laughs) and you have to say something poignant before you walk off. Yeah. What might you tell them? To enjoy it, to make sure they're enjoying the training because if they're enjoying it, they'll keep doing it and then they'll get good at it. You know what I mean? So that, that's what I would say. Make sure they're enjoying it. That's the most important thing you can do to make sure you're going to make progress in your martial arts. Mr. Abernathy teaches a number of seminars throughout Europe but he does get to the U.S. from time to time. I'd suggest you check his seminar schedule and see if you can make it. I certainly have plans to attend. And if karate is not your style, I think you should still check it out. There's good stuff in there regardless of what you practice. Thank you, Mr. Abernathy, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with a bunch of photos, links to social media, and a link to his website, which is how you get to everything he does, including his great podcast. You can follow us on social media too. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Do you have a favorite episode of the show? If you do, I'd like to encourage you to find it on our website and share it with somebody. Our download numbers are going up, and that's because of you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's because of everything you've done as listeners that this show continues to grow. Thanks for your time. Until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.